The League of Women Voters is a trusted nonpartisan organization made up of women and men volunteer members that work to help citizens make informed choices in elections. While we do not endorse any candidate or political party, we are directly involved in presenting the important issues to keep our community strong, and we give voters the information they need to make informed election decisions. Today's forum is the second of four we are presenting before the November 6th general election. There was a forum September 18th for State Ballot Measure 79 and 84 a ballot measure forum to consider local ballot measures for Portland and Multnomah County is this Thursday at 7 in the evening right here. A forum for Portland mayor candidates is Monday, October the 8th at 1 in the afternoon, again right here. All four forums will be available for on-demand viewing from a link on our website, lwvpdx.org, by October 12th. The sponsor for all of these forums is the Multnomah Bar Foundation. The Multnomah Bar Foundation has generously provided the funding that allows us to record our forums so that voters can view them at home at their convenience. We thank the Multnomah Bar Foundation for their support of our work. Voters can also look to our nonpartisan voters guide to read answers to questions posed to all candidates as well as nonpartisan presentation of pallet measures. We expect the print and internet versions of the voter's guide to be available beginning on or about October 6. After October 6, you will find free print copies at Multnomah County Library branches and in the Multnomah County Elections Office. And then the internet version on our website, lwvpdx.org. Finally, to streamline your ballot research, go to vote411.org. Enter your street address to find the voter's guide information for the candidates and measures that will appear on your ballot. Vote411.org is available now. If you have not registered to vote, the deadline is October 16th. Please note, you will need to register if you have moved since you last voted, changed your name, changed your political party, or have never registered to vote in Oregon. You can register right here at the forum. See our member with the yellow register to vote button in the back and the clipboard. You can also find registration forms at election offices, post offices, Department of Motor Vehicle offices, or you can register online through the Oregon Secretary of State's website. Now, let me introduce our moderator, Professor Barbara Dudley. Barbara is adjunct professor, Hatfield School of Government, Portland State University. She is also a member of the League of Women Voters of Portland, as are our candidates tonight. Barbara, I turn the forum over to you. Thank you, Mary. Um, first, let me introduce our two candidates for Portland City Commissioner Position One. Mary Nolan on my left, and uh, Amanda Fritz. Um, our topic for this evening's forum is how to govern Portland so as to achieve both equity and opportunity for all of its residents. We'll divide the forum into three parts. At the beginning of each of the first two segments, I will ask the candidate a qu candidates a question. They will each have two minutes to respond, and then we'll have a discussion. In the final segment, each candidate will have an equal amount of time to address the last question, to respond to my follow-up questions, and then to present her closing statement. Our timekeepers will hold up signs to notify when the speaker has 15 seconds remaining and when the speaker must stop speaking. So, shall we begin? Um, the first segment is um, about equity. And to begin our equity discussion, I would like to ask you, Mary first in this segment, Mary Nolan first, to describe for us how the budgets of the city and the Portland Development Commission can be expended to benefit all Portland residents. Mary, you'll have two minutes for this. Thank you, Barbara. And may I extend thanks to my fellow league members for hosting this event and to the Multnomah County Bar for sponsoring it. It's wonderful that voters have an opportunity to help see us explore important issues 
uh, that affect our lives and our um, communities. So to the question, which is very difficult to answer in two minutes, and I know you appreciate that. Um, I'll admit, first of all, since the topic is how we budget either city agencies or Portland Development Commission, I'll admit to being something of a budget wonk. And it isn't just that I like numbers. I am passionate about budgets because they really speak to what our priorities are. They speak to who we are as a community, where we invest, is a reflection of what we think is most important. And to the specific issue, Professor, that you've asked about how to encourage those uh, budgets for both city agencies and PDC to expand opportunities and um, make equity a more real aspect of living in Portland, let me just give a couple of examples because I think we can't explore the entire subject in just um, two minutes. Um, it will require a pretty fundamental change in the way we approach appropriating money, budgeting. We need to really focus on the outcomes that we're trying to accomplish and not just the actions we want to support. So for example, if we want all Portlanders to be within walking distance or biking distance of a park where they can um, do exercise and visit with their neighbors and explore the outdoors and other beneficial things of, of living in a livable community, then we have to think about how we deliver that in all the different parts of Portland. And it means we invest in building or expanding parks in neighborhoods that don't have them instead of necessarily just counting up, we're going to deliver so many pieces of service, so many grass clippings in every park around the city. And I look forward to exploring that more in the dialogue. Um, Amanda Fritz, two minutes. Thank you, and I, I thank everybody for being here tonight. I also am a League of Women Voters mem member, and I thank uh, Metro East, who with Portland Community Media does such a great job of getting community media to our all of our citizens and sharing democracy by both, by both um, citizen-led programs and by covering events like this. I've been working on the issue of equity and budgeting for the last four years. We've been cutting budgets every year that I've been on the city council, and we've been very intentional about looking at where we expend money and how we can continue to provide services, particularly services to people who are most in need. So Sam Adams and I initiated four years ago budget mapping, where we asked the bureaus to tell us where they're spending their money. Those are a conversation starter because sometimes an expenditure doesn't mean that it benefits the folks in that community. The big example being Powell Butte Reservoirs serve the entire city, not just outer southeast Portland. But they're a good way for us to start the conversation about who, pay, who pays, who benefits, and is that fair? And that's how I make my budgeting decisions, and that's how what we've put a lot of effort in over the last four years, culminating in the, recognizing the need for an Office of Equity and Human Rights, which I established in September of last year, to make sure that all of the bureaus are not only thinking about how they spend their money, but where they spend their money, and that's how you get to the outcomes. It's Everything gets done in the budget in the first six months, and then the rest of the fiscal year is in expending those budgets. So I've been looking at how we've been doing cuts in the least painful manner to citizens over the course of this horrible recession. We've made some progress. And last year, Portland was in the top 10 cities for job growth in the United States. The partnership that the council has had with the Portland Development Commission is part of that. And looking at how do we help people who are most in need with job training, with support for community college scholarships, for other strategic programs that help make sure that everybody has access to opportunities, everyone has op access to jobs, and everyone has services in the city of Portland. Thank you. Um, I would like to expand on the notion of budget cuts and how we achieve equity in the face of having to cut, because it looks as though we're going to be in that mode for a while yet. Um, and particularly, I'd like both of you to address the question of the disproportionate lack of infrastructure and transportation options and parks um, on in part, uh, Portland's far east side and how you remedy that 
in a time of budget woes, and particularly transportation options are, are really difficult, and TriMet, I know, is not under your purview, but what do you do to address the problems of the east side of this city? Mary, you could start on this one. I've spent a lot of time during this campaign visiting in neighborhoods all over the city, but particularly neighborhoods east of I-205. Um, in fact, several of my allies and, and advisors from East Portland have really pushed me to make sure I spend a, a fair amount of my time visiting those neighborhoods, the residential neighborhoods, the community centers, the smaller business districts, to really get a handle on how, that, um, how those communities work. Um, and while we're going to continue living under fiscal constraints, I would actually want to see Portland turn that around, not to be focusing on the cuts, but to be focusing on what it is we are delivering. And this isn't a Pollyanna reaction, but if we focus on what we do deliver, what the priorities are to make our neighborhoods livable and accessible, I think that changes a couple of things. It changes the decisions and helps us focus on how people experience the service and not just counting the number of times we send a truck out to pave a pothole or we send a police car out to respond to an emergency. If we look at it from the customer's point of view, if you, if you can see it that way. Um, and th the other thing it does is it engages the community residents, homeowners, business owners, in wanting to shape that. And when they do, uh, then I think you see results that reflect what their priorities are better than if we don't engage them. Amanda, you want to comment on that? Sure. I live in an area of deep southwest Portland that was annexed in 1979 and shares many of the same challenges as East Portland and other areas annexed um, in the relatively near past, but in fact, over 40 years ago now. So I was partnering with East Portland before it was fashionable to care about East Portland. Back in the uh, mid-1990s, I served on the Citywide Land Use Committee and co-chaired it with Bonnie McKnight of the Russell neighborhood in East Portland, and have been looking at these issues for since that time. It's one of the reasons that I ran for city council in the first place, was to make sure that everybody all over Portland knows that the council cares and that the council is looking at different areas of the city. So um, I've been the champion for the East Portland Action Plan. We passed it in the, my first quarter in office in 2009 and then funded both a staff person and money for projects that East Portlanders decide how they want to spend that money. And they have just one staff person to do that. And in several of the budgets since then, it, since it was a special appropriation, it kind of got missed until I kept putting it back into the budget because it is so important f for me. And in fact, this past budget session, I asked for it to be put under the Office of Neighborhood Involvement temporarily so that we make sure that it continues to be part of an identified budget. Because there's so many different pieces of the city's budget that unless somebody is watching out for the particular piece uh, that she knows that somebody cares about, it could easily get missed. So I, I have also been working with the business districts in East Portland. I'm a member of the Park Rose Business District, the Midway Business Association, and the Gateway Area Business Association, and visit frequently at those business associations which was part of making the Neighborhood Prosperity initi Initiative start in, this, in six districts in Northeast and East Portland, which again is dedicating specific amounts of money and giving very little staff attention to it, which paradoxically is a good thing. As long as you have some staff to help uh, the volunteers, it means that then the volunteers and the business owners and the residents are directing how that money is spent and who better to know how best to invest money in a particular area than those who work and live and play there. So I'm proud of those that work. The, another thing that we have done recently is, and I say we, the city council has worked together as a team for the past four years. It's been crucial through the recession that we not have bickering and um, a lack of, of cohesion on the council, which could easily have happened when there's the pie is too small and you're deciding how to 
uh, slice it, but we worked together, the five of us, to identify a new pilot project to set alternative standards for street um, construction, so that instead of the full wide street with pl planter strips and full sidewalks on both sides, we're going to be trying an alternative approach, which instead of costing $300, dollars a linear foot is only going to cost $60 a foot. There'll still need to be some assistance to homeowners and residents who can't even, who can't afford the $60 a foot, but we're looking at how can we have alternative standards that gets the job done without excessive expense, and that'll be particularly helpful in East Portland and in my neighborhood, uh, West Portland Park, which houses the only Title I low-income school on the west side, so that we too might have the benefit of sidewalks in someday within my lifetime. I want to direct um, both of you, Mary, first to the other part of the original question about the Portland Development Commission, because that too has a budget um, that and is often accused of expending that budget in a not equitable fashion. Um, and I think the way I would put it is that the urban renewal projects um, often well, they divert tax revenues, but the flip side of them is, is gentrification. And that's a problem we're facing more and more in parts of Portland. Um, and it pushes the original um, and perhaps lower income residents of a neighborhood out and out and out. How do you address that? And do you think that PDC needs to be brought more under the control of the council? Do you think that's been done sufficiently to date? What, what's your response on, on how that budget should be handled? Urban renewal and the financing mechanism, tax increment financing, which I know you understand quite well, Professor, um, has had some very good successes in Portland, and it has had some big mistakes and problems. And I think the very first thing we do is we objectively evaluate what has worked well? When have urban renewal areas achieved the outcome that was intended, which is to revitalize areas that had um, deteriorated into unproductive, either um, residential areas or blighted areas that were not safe, um, not attractive, and deteriorating as people were abandoning them? And, in those instances, such as um, the South Auditorium, the in initial one, I think you can see the benefit that has resulted from a thoughtful approach to that. But then we look at some of the other urban renewal areas, and we have had the problems you're talking about, where um, areas were designated that had active, vibrant neighborhood communities, a sense of place, for people, a sense of local ownership, particularly in many of them, local minority ownership of businesses, where people in our community could invest their time or invest in, in sweat equity and develop some wealth and a stake and all the stabilizing value that that has for a neighborhood. And in some of those areas, you're right that the urban renewal investments have instead resulted in displacing stable, rich, um, uh, diverse communities and scattered the residents because they've been priced out of the housing. So we need to really objectively evaluate what components have been successful and can we really look in a mirror and honestly evaluate where we've made mistakes. Then we've got to use the lessons we learn from that to apply them to, for example, the Lentz urban renewal area, the Gateway urban renewal area in East Portland, so that we can have those mimic as many of the successful aspects and avoid the displacement and the gentrification and the de destabilizing effect that they've had on communities. Amanda, you get... Um afraid a little short changed on this one we'll let you do more but give us a minute of your um, approach to this question I think we again we've made progress in collaborating with the Portland Development Commission that is governed by a, an appointed board of five people and they have done a good job of looking at strategic investments 
particularly in the Neighborhood Prosperity Initiative, which doesn't increase long-term debt, and that's a key piece for me. I will continue to vote against creation of new long-term debt. I voted against the Education Urban Renewal District for that reason. That is not a blighted area, and that has already had a turn at urban renewal. We should be investing more in Gateway and Lentz, and we should be looking at ways to, in to listen to the community more. That's one of the things that we discussed when we just passed the Cully plan, which isn't an urban renewal area, but it is a, a neighborhood plan with some rezoning, which is likely to change the neighborhood. And everyone talked to, from the community to the city council talked about the importance of avoid of learning from the lessons of the past. Cully's a wonderful, diverse neighborhood, perhaps the most diverse neighborhood in the state. And so how can we make sure that those who live, work, and play there now are able to do that as it becomes an even better place to live? That's, That's actually a, minute, a great right? transition to our next question. So this conversation will continue. Um, the next question is about opportunity for Portland residents. Um, and what we would like you to do is to describe what you think city leaders can realistically do to benefit the economic position of those who live in Portland, given the current national and global economic climate. Um, and Amanda, you can start with that. So if you would like I'll to just, just... Yes, continue. Right. Because I think one of the things we can and must do, and which I have done and will continue to do, is to listen to the residents in an, in an area where changes are proposed. So you may recall there was a proposal to put uh, baseball in Lentz Park. And I was involved in discussions with the communities. And there were a lot of folks in the community on both sides. And for but as far as an economic development tool, baseball is not an economic development tool. It's certainly a, uh, something that a lot of Portlanders care about a lot. And so the community, um, the preponderance of the opinions of the community were that that was not how they wanted to spend urban renewal dollars nor how to use their park. And so that that's an example of where I listened to what I heard. I answer all my own emails, at least I did before I was um, doing a lot of campaigning after my general work day. My usual work day is 9 to 9, and I work Monday through Saturday. And usually I go home and, and read my own emails, and for the first three years I was answering them all. So I answered 20,000 emails in my first three years, and that way I know what folks are telling me from their hearts and right from their computers to mine in the middle of the night and sometimes having an exchange in the middle of the night on Saturday about what people think about should happen in their neighborhoods. There are a few things that are absolutely the right thing or absolutely the wrong thing to do in the city of Portland. F on a lot of issues, it's a matter of what do we think would be the best for the most people, and that really speaks to the equity issue. Best for the most people, but also making sure that those who haven't had access to opportunities before, those who haven't had access to talking with city commissioners before, have that opportunity to truly be at the table helping to make the decisions. Thank you. Mary? The same question. And I'm going to focus on the economic, enhancing the economic position of Portlanders part of your question. Because I think we need, first of all, to be humble about what we can do. Uh, we are a city. We cannot change by ourselves the course of the global economy or even the national economy. But we can help people be prepared to interact with it. And I believe that's what cities really are about. And I, over the course of this campaign and the 12 years I've served in the legislature, I've listened to small business owners, mid-sized manufacturers and large employers in the city and around Oregon. And specifically for the last several months, I've been asking them, what can we change? What can we do for you? that makes it more likely that you'll be hiring more people in the next year, that you'll be expanding your workforce here in Portland, because I think that's a critical part of enhancing the economic position of people who live in Portland. And I am impressed with the feedback I'm getting. The highest priority I hear most often is make sure we have a great school system. K-12, even early childhood education, robust community colleges, and a vibrant public and private university system. Second is make sure that we know what the rules are. Give us some clarity. We're not asking you to change the rules. They don't want to reduce environmental standards. They don't want to reduce 
neighborhood livability. They just want some clarity. And then they said, give us good value for the services you deliver. We're willing to pay for them if we know that the value is good. Thank you. Um, Amanda, to you on that question of the needs and interests of small business owners, do you have some um, different view or expanded view on that subject? Well, I agree that school funding is absolutely the most crucial issue facing our state and has been since Measure 5 passed in 1990. And the legislature has fundamentally failed to fund our schools at the level that they need to be funded to the point where the city, even facing job losses in things like street maintenance and other vital services, dedicated $7 million this year to support our school districts all of the school districts in the city of Portland, which paid for over 100 teachers in the Portland Public School District and in other school districts a similar amount based on per capita. The schools will not go down the tubes on my watch. They didn't while my children were going through Portland Public Schools for 17 years because in part of the actions of the city council and the county commission. So I am absolutely committed to doing what we can on the city council, recognizing that that is a state responsibility. And I hear that from business owners, from families. We all care about public schools. When I came here, chose to come here, did a nationwide search to find the best place to live and raise a family in 1985 before my husband graduated from medical school, we came because over 90% of the families were sending their kids to public schools, and I think that attracts a lot of professionals who add vibrancy to our community. We are no longer at over 90%, and we need to make sure that we reverse that trend. The other core thing that we need to do for small businesses is to provide public safety and infrastructure, including parking. That businesses need parking, and we yes, we support Alternative modes of transportation, transit, walking, sidewalks are important, bicycles are important. Uh, when you go to the uh, hardware store to get a load of wood, you're probably going to be using a car and need to park somewhere in the close proximity to it. Although Mary and I were at the mattress lot on uh, Sandy Boulevard this past weekend where they have mattress delivery by bicycle, which I thought was quite stunning. Um, <laughs> And there's a picture of it on my Twitter account if anybody's interested. I don't think they do the king size mattresses on the, the bicycle, but it's N not in your neighborhood or mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mary, back to you on that question of schools, actually. I was interested that both of you felt that that was the greatest need in terms of opportunity. Um, and and viability of business, the business sector here, as well as obviously individual residents. But what can the city council do about schools? What, what you're, you know, it is a state responsibility for the most part. What, what does the city do that is helpful? The city partners with all the school districts, as well as community, uh, Portland Community College, Portland State, the private universities. But I think the city needs to do, city leaders have an opportunity to do more than just uh, direct services. City leaders have an opportunity to convene and create the momentum of community-wide support and energy beyond, behind a more stable, adequate, robust long-term program that includes funding, but also includes improvements in the, uh, the way that uh, instruction is provided. And so, for example, I have volunteered on, I'm pretty sure, every single Portland school bond measure for at least 20 years, uh, long before my daughter was uh, even around, let alone in school, um, less uh, in May of 2011, I was on the finance committee for the Portland Public Schools operating levy and bond measure. We succeeded then in passing the operating levy. We did not pass. The voters did not approve the bond measure, but I volunteered for the Park Rose School District as well when they passed their bond measure by just a few votes in May of 2011 and took time off from my campaign this past spring. Uh, to volunteer and canvas for the David Douglas School District because I believe the entire city deserves that kind of support. And I'm endorsing and supporting the Portland Public School Bond Measure this year. But beyond being just a volunteer, I think city leaders have an, an opportunity and indeed an obligation to 
motivate and convene the people, the groups around the city that will that will move us forward to make sure we don't have to be doing these bond measures all the time, that there is a sustainable, robust funding for schools that at least matches what the quality education model says we ought to do. And that takes, dead, that takes really prioritizing it on your calendar. And it also means having relationships with all the groups that can pull that off, business, uh, organized labor, PTAs, uh, church leaders, and all of those people, and using your personal connections to make it happen. Let me, if unless, Amanda, you have something you very much want to add on the question of the city council and its relationship to schools, I want to move you both to talking about something neither of you have said. Actually, yet. I do have Go some ahead. other Go. things, because one of the reasons I want to get reelected is to continue some of the initiatives that we've started in the last four years and make sure that the successful ones are continue to be funded. Some of those include um, coordinating all of the school districts and all of the, the interests in our county in the Cradle to Career program and all hands raised, which is important public schools foundation is now countywide, so that we look at things like outdoor school funding collectively for all of us and not just as Portland public schools and the other two districts entirely within our city as well as the others with pieces in our district. I want to make sure that we continue the Future Connect and ninth grade counts programs, which brings uh, high school students into City Hall during the, the summer, give them internships, give them an incentive to graduate because then if they graduate they get a, a two-year scholarship to community college uh, um, and we have amazing stories of, of students who are the first in their family to graduate and the first in their family to go to college because of that program that the city funded. So the city can do a number of things around the issue of school funding. I also want to get reelected so that I can go to the legislature next spring and demand that the legislature fix it. It's the legislature's job and only the members of the House and the members of the Senate who represent the entire state can do that work. It's it's a, come to the point where every school district in Oregon is suffering, and I don't want to keep watching and doing the Band-Aids, and yes, we need to do the construction bonds and the levies and the, the things that we can do, but we cannot fix school funding throughout the entire state of Oregon. The legislature's job is to do that, and we don't want to be in, this, in the position of going, which some districts in Oregon are already on four-day weeks. So there's that piece, and then there's also the, um, the coordination with TriMet. I'm very proud of having helped to save the student uh, passes so that high school students can get to, to school. That's the most fundamental thing that, that we, we have to provide as a community, a big community with TriMet, is to make sure that the high school students could do that. So those are the examples of the things that I've worked on in my first term, and I want to make sure that, that um, those projects continue to thrive. Okay, thank you. And now, to move you on, neither of you have said the word jobs yet, which I find interesting since everybody else seems to think that that's the... <laughs> I want to know what you think, perhaps I missed it, I want to know what you think uh, is the appropriate role of the city government in either saving or attracting jobs. And I want you to address both public sector and private sector jobs. So what can the city do to in improve the employment opportunities in this city? Mary, you could begin. And I certainly talked about hiring new people, but I may not have technically the used word the jobs. word jobs. But I, I think that's what I meant, Barbara. Um, <laughs> most people who live or work in Portland work for a small company. And the overwhelming share of people who have a job in Portland, it is for a private company. Public employees do very, very important work, and I don't mean to minimize that, and I, I do think it's important to consider that. But what the city can do to encourage and facilitate the expansion of uh, private companies, from two, three employee companies to some of our employers have several thousand employees in Portland, is first of all, make them feel welcome. 
I've spent, as I said, a lot of time visiting on the job, at the plants, at the warehouses, in the design rooms, in the computer um, labs of software companies. Not because I think in an hour or two I can become an expert in those companies, but because I want to understand the atmosphere that they work in, and I want to get to know the owners or the people who are leading the company. Um, I have been surprised at how often when I do that, one of the first comments is, no one from City Hall has ever come and asked us about this stuff, so thanks. And it may be because I started a business, built it here in Portland, um, to the point of employing 10 people, that that's the way I think. So we can provide very good services, transportation, infrastructure, utilities, public safety, and we can, as I said earlier, make sure that the rules that they have to follow when they're expanding, building a new facility or, or changing something are very clear and they get their answers or their permit very quickly because that changes whether they can afford to invest here or they're going to take their money and invest somewhere else. Thank you. Amanda, a minute on this. We uh, lost 1,700 public sector jobs over the course of the recession since uh, 2009, and we gained 6,800 private sector jobs. So we have created some conditions where private businesses can flourish despite having laid off half our permit center staff because we had to cut because we didn't have the funding for that. So I acknowledge the great work that has been done under very difficult circumstances, particularly by staff in the permit center that um, are now starting to build back again, which I'm rejoicing to see that. Some of the things that we've done over the past three years to stimulate those jobs are suspending some of the systems development charges particularly on accessory dwelling units, which are the small granny flats that you can build on your house or convert your a larger house to have a smaller apartment in. That has stimulated a, a niche in the construction business that the rest of the construction world has been very dormant except for public process projects, and I'm very grateful that we have had urban renewal districts in progress, that we've been able to invest in the streetcar, we've invested in building uh, the Bud Clark Commons, we're now doing Gray's Landing in South Waterfront. So if you looked around over the last three years, it was mostly the public projects that were employing in those good construction jobs. The other thing that we have recently done is, with in partnership with the unions and with uh, um, construction companies, establish a community benefits agreement so that when we are do when the city is funding major projects like the renovation or the re redoing of the Interstate Avenue Water Bureau facility, that everybody gets an opportunity to participate in those construction jobs. And Hoffman Construction is helping us with that pilot project to make sure that it's not just those folks who've traditionally been involved in the construction businesses that um, are have access to those good jobs. And again, Mary and I just came from the Urban League Forum at, before this event, discussing with folks how can we make sure that everybody has access to the jobs, contracts, and services in the city. Thank you. We have to end this discussion and move on to the final segment now. So starting with Mary, um, what I want you to do is to spend two minutes, again, to give us your assessment of your own character and leadership abilities, your strengths, your weaknesses, how you work with colleagues, how you relate to staff, um, to advisory boards also, and to the public. Describing our own personal character and leadership abilities, tough to do. But let me tell you, I am absolutely passionate about equal rights and equal access. It has driven much of what I have spent my energy on, and it is what lights up my life in my professional work as well as in my volunteer work. I am driven by the notion that education is both an equalizer and it provides community glue. It gives us common experiences and an understanding of each other that goes well beyond technical training. Um, I grew up um, with many opportunities, and I come away from that with a deep sense of gratitude for the work others have done to give me opportunities. And that 
gives me a desire to pay it forward for others, uh, which motivates a lot of my work as well. Um, people will tell you that I am honest, sometimes to a fault. Um, I am continuing to evolve, mean, much more so now that I'm in my 50s than when I was in my 30s. When I was in my 30s, I knew everything I needed to know. And now that I'm in, in my 50s, I've come to realize that, you know, I don't know everything I need to know. I've still got a lot to learn. I work hard, probably as hard as anyone. I'm sometimes a bit impatient. I'm comfortable surrounded by people who know more than I do, certainly about particular subjects. And I seek out other expertise that I don't have. I can see and I actively nurture talents and insight and energy in others and see my role often not so much as the doer, but as the facilitator to get things done that other people care about and I remove the obstacles and bring them the resources to get things done. Um, in short, um, I'm willing to shoulder the blame, but I'm very happy to share the fame. Thank you. In this segment, I'm going to follow up with you for a okay. few minutes and then turn to Amanda and have the same question and the same follow-up. Fair enough. So here's my first question, and I would like both of you to address this in your order. Um, on this upcoming council, should you win this election, you would be working with four men, two of whom will be new to the council, all of whom have very strong, willful, and somewhat quirky personalities. Um, how will you deal with them? And, or maybe I should say, how will you encourage them to deal with you and with each other in a collegial and productive manner? This is the story of my life. Um, I was in the first class of women admitted to Dartmouth College, so I was on campus among 200 women with 3,200 men, and I studied math, which means that from a very early age in my adult life, I've been the only woman in the room. Um, I pursued a career in technology, which again put me in as the only woman often in a room with men. Um, and let me just say about the the people who I might serve with, um, beyond each of them being strong-willed, there is incredible talent among that group of people that I'm anxious to find ways to complement um, and expand upon and collaborate with, because I think there are a lot of talents there that I can learn from and I can augment uh, because I bring different sets of skills. Um, one of the sets of skills I bring that none of them have um, is that I've started a business that I talked about earlier. I've started and run a successful business. No one currently on the council and no one among the candidates has done that. And it's a perspective that I think ought to be in the room as we dis discuss issues around that you talked about with jobs and economic prosperity and equity of opportunity around the city. Um, but the, I guess I'll go back to the comment that I am comfortable and have been for a long time working with people who have different perspectives than I do, who bring different expertise than I do, and finding a way to add all of that talent together to get a better outcome than any one of us could get alone. Thank you. Um, I have another question which is related to actually this campaign, which is campaign finance has come up a lot in this campaign. And my question, I, I think, is why does it matter? What is it that you find compelling or important about the subject of campaign finance? Do you believe that it will, in fact, influence your own decision making if those who give you money would influence your decision making? Every per person who lives in Portland or works in Portland or is invested in Portland that I talk with informs my thinking. Whether they are supporting Amanda or me, whether they've contributed money to her campaign or volunteered with her campaign or mine, I benefit from the interaction just by having the conversation, the dialogue, the challenge that sometimes they push back on my point of view and I 
listen and learn. Um, so I think the, the real point of your question, is there a disproportionate influence um, because someone's made a contribution? And I have 12 years of experience with that, um, having run six times successfully, been elected six times to the legislature, and taken contributions to be able to communicate with voters. And let's remember, campaign finance is about finance, which is the way, one of the ways we communicate with voters. A lot of it is by personal contact, but there are only a, so many people who can fit in this room, so many people who can listen on the TV. Um, so there, we need to communicate in other ways. Um, we do that through the mail and through other um, paid communication. That's what we raise money for. That's the purpose of campaign finance, at least in my mind, is to educate voters about their options. But in, in uh, six times running for the legislature and in this campaign for city council, um, first of all, no one has ever asked in my entire public service career for me to change my vote as a condition of a contribution. And I think they don't ask because they know the answer, and the answer is no. I have support both volunteer time and financially from individuals and groups who disagree with each other on pretty big issues, and yet both find me to be a common ground. Not because I agree with them on every issue. I have voted against the interests of people who've given me money and told them I was going to do it. But they trust me to be honest. They trust me to tell them what I'm going to do and then to do what I've said I'd do. And um, I think that's the way I'd approach this. It's the way I've always approached it. I just can't be any other way. Thank you. Amanda, um, if you would start with a couple minutes on the same question of your assessment of your own character and your leadership abilities, your strengths, your weaknesses, your relationships with colleagues, with the public, with your staff, with advisory boards, and so on, and then we'll go from there. When I was 12 years old, I read a series of books on uh, Sue Barton, student nurse, reading your son, you've read up to, reading to Sue Barton, superintendent nurse. And from that moment on, I wanted to be a nurse when I grew up. And I went into, I did nursing school after having graduated from Cambridge and um, had never regretted my 27 years in nursing. I think like a nurse. I um, think like a woman. I think like a mother and I act in those manners too. I care about helping. I love to help, and that's what the characteristics that I bring to city council is that every day when I get up, I look at who and what can I help with today. And so I have, and I'm also a community organizer. I started thinking about running for city council when I was on strike from OHSU in 2001 to 2002. And we went on strike because we didn't have enough nurses to take care of our patients and that we thought that nursing was going in the wrong direction in the state of Oregon. And indeed, in the uh, four year, no, six years that I was uh, working at OHSU after the strike, my wages went up 40%. But I became a spokesperson during the strike because I haven't, since our children were born, been the primary breadwinner in our family. My husband has been. So some of the other nurses who were on strike were concerned that if they spoke out, that there would be retribution after they went back in, after we won the strike, which of course we did with the help of multiple community members, uh, the legislature, the governor, and labor unions. I didn't have to worry about whether it would mean that our family would become homeless if I spoke out and then got fired. So I became a spokesperson for those who uh, didn't have the time or the capacity to be able to speak out against what we perceived as injustice. And that's what I do on the city council, that I speak for those who don't have as much time to invest in going through every single item on the city council agenda. Because just like reading the doctor's orders and making sure that I gave the right medication while I was on city in, in the hospital, reading through every item on the city council agenda and making sure I understand it is part of my service to the citizens of Portland. Thank you. Um, would you briefly also address the question, you've had the experience now of being on the council, being the only woman on the council, you will, again, if you are elected, be the only woman on the council um, with a different configuration of men. And I'm curious how you will work with them or get them to work with you. 
There will always be five strong people on the Portland City Council, and I have proven that I can get along with folks as diverse as Randy Leonard and uh, Dan Saltzman. I mean, Randy thinks like a firefighter, and Dan Saltzman thinks like an environmental engineer and businessman. Uh, Sam has had years working in the legislature and in City Hall, and thinks with that perspective. And Nick is a civil rights uh, was a civil rights lawyer, so he comes from that perspective. It makes for a very vibrant group of different ways of thinking. And and we have worked very hard over the course of the recession to not have the squabbles and the getting to three votes behind the scenes that uh, prevented T Mayor Tom Potter from doing much of his agenda in the previous four years, that most of our uh, votes come by consensus. And I have worked very hard to supplement and assist my colleagues on the council, not really caring who gets the credit, but adding value so that we get more things done. And, we, and indeed, we've done that over the course of the recession. The last thing Portland has needed while we were all struggling so much was for the city council to be bickering and having public meltdowns. So we didn't, and we haven't, and we won't. Um, I'm endorsed by both Dan Saltzman and Nick Fish, the two continuing members of the council. I'm endorsed by uh, Multnomah County Chair Jeff Kogan and other county commissioners. And again, the county and the city cannot be squabbling. And what we've done over the course of the recession is figuring out that if the city puts in a little money and the county puts in a little money and hopefully gets some from grants and other partnerships with the private community, that we can get more done. And then we're all invested in making sure that we get more things done. So that's been, that was why I ran for city council. It was to make sure that we had somebody on the council that people could trust. I went from being a nurse, which is the most trusted profession, to being a politician, which is one of the most despised. And I'm still the same person, and I want to make sure that people understand how we make decisions. They're not always going to agree with every decision. You know, on some decisions, the, the community is split 50-50, so there's no way I can possibly uh, um, be the spokesperson for both for everyone or vote the way that everybody wants me to. What I can do is make sure that everybody knows that they were heard and that their viewpoint was considered, no matter which way I come down on it. So, And that's how our council has worked hard to proceed, and that's how I expect the new council, regardless of who is mayor and working with Commissioner Elect Novick, will be able to get things done because I've had that experience of being in a, a situation which is so unlike the legislature. It's not partisan part politics, and I'm so glad that I never run for office as um, a member of a political party because everybody cares about kids, everybody cares about trees and jobs and, and the things that make Portland great, that's not a Democratic or Republican issue. Those, those things are areas that we can agree on and that's what you can do on the city council is instead of just getting to three votes, you can look at how do we make this better for everybody and who do we need to listen to in order to be able to get that done. On that question of who do you need to listen to, you have spent a, a lot of time with the neighborhood associations and various community-based organizations. And I wanted to ask you whether or not, what your view is of the strengths and weaknesses of the neighborhood and community involvement system that Portland is so well known for. Do you think it works? How would you, what would you do to make it work better? It works a lot better than it did four years ago, and it works a lot better than it did 15 years ago when I was on a task force looking at the neighborhood system to see who's, who's participating and who's not at the table. So one of the things that we've done over the past four years is greatly strengthened our diverse civic leadership program, which partners with communities that aren't geographic boundary neighborhoods, but rather are entities like the Urban League and Latino Network and Elders in Action and other similar groups so that there's more emphasis on encouraging people and, and letting folks know how to come to the table. Part of our diverse civic leadership program is doing culturally specific trainings to let folks know how do you participate in city, county, and metro government decisions? How do you, how does it all work? Um, and so then encouraging people to but then take that training and then participate by being put on boards and commissions and by being spokesperson for their community that's not a ge geographic neighborhood, that's how we bring more people to the table. And it's been inspiring how much more vibrant our um, discussions have been 
One of the things I did, uh, first of all, in 2009 was say that the City Council should not be setting our legislative priorities, both for the state and the federal government, by ourselves. Previously, there was a token public hearing in November, at which time the decisions had already been made by the bureaus and the City Council on what the legislative priorities should do, should be. In uh, 2009, and then increasingly uh, since then, we hold public meetings where anybody can come and put anything on the table as a suggestion for changing regulations or adding um adding legislation, and you, you don't have to know whether it's a, a city, a county, a state, or a, a federal issue, just come and tell us your priorities. And this past week, we had um, not only sign language translation, but also Spanish language translation. In the previous one, we had Somali translation, and what was cool was folks who needed that interpretation cared about very much the same thing that people who speak English did. Thank you. Um, we need to conclude now. You will each have one minute for a closing statement to say whatever it is you haven't had a chance to say yet. Um, and we will begin with Amanda Fritz. Um, so Amanda, one more minute. It's been a privilege to serve as your Portland City Commissioner for the last four years. I've learned a lot and I want to put into effect the things that I've learned. One of the crucial reasons why I hope Portlanders will reelect me in five weeks tonight is that I have the experience of mental health nursing and we have been told by the Department of Justice that we are unconstitutional in the police's handling of or care for or interactions with people with mental illnesses. I'm the only one on the current council and the only one on a future council who has the expertise to work with people experiencing mental illnesses and their advocacy advocacy communities to figure out the, the solution to that pub problem. I didn't have a chance to answer the public, the financing question in the previous section. How are campaigns are financed matters. When I ran in, in 2008, I got 1,000 donations of $5 from people who are registered to vote in Portland. Then I got public money. And it has made a huge difference to electing a regular community member to the city council without anybody having to even wonder whether campaign contributions have affected the way I vote. I want people to continue to trust me and I'd like ask for your vote on May, on uh, November 6th. Thank you. And Mary. Portland is such a wonderful community with all of its fabulous opportunities and even with some daunting, daunting challenges and gaps that we face right now. To bring us forward and to make sure everybody benefits from the progress we'll have, we need effective, focused managers who can squeeze value out of every single dollar that we spend on city services. That's what I bring to the city council. We should go quickly beyond studying issues, which we're really good at doing here in Portland, to actually getting things done, to changing the outcomes for the people who live and work here. I offer Portland voters a proven track record of progressive leadership that delivers results that matter to regular Portlanders. And so I ask for your vote and thank you for your time. Thank you and thank you both. Um, Mary Nolan, Amanda Fritz, this ends our candidate forum. <laughs>